Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name's Nadia and this is This Week in Sex. So This Week in Sex over here in Australia, where I'm from, because yes guys, I am from Australia, even though many of you keep insisting in the comments section that I'm from England, have never been to England by the way, would like to go though. But here in Australia, researchers are currently trialing a new nasal spray on women to see if it is going to be effective for treating low libido in women. And it's focused on using a specific molecule called BP-101, which essentially works in the brain on the GABA pathway. And that pathway influences pleasure and desire. Now, there are just so many issues with this and I personally have a big issue with it. We have in the past attempted to develop drug pharmaceutical treatments to tackle low female libido and they regularly fail because they completely dismiss the highly sophisticated ways that the female libido works. Unlike men who are aroused reactively and therefore can be really responsive to pharmaceutical treatments, drugs like Viagra that can really help men to be able to get back into enjoying sex. It's not as simple for women. Research shows that women tend to be aroused contextually. This means that simply seeing our partner take their clothes off or even having our partner touch our naked body isn't necessarily going to turn us on. The context, the wider situation has to be right. And that's why things like date nights and romance are so important to women because women have to feel that we're sexy, that our partner partner cares about us, that they've been saying nice things to us all day. Simple things like the fact that we asked our partner to take the trash out five or six times today and they haven't done it are going to play on our mind and mean that we can't get turned on when you're taking our clothes off and trying to get down to business. And so that's why I just am personally not a fan of these types of medical treatments, particularly because what they really serve to do is to pathologize the female libido and to treat women in general like like if we do not want sex a lot, there's something horribly wrong with us. And what we know from the research is that sexual desire exists on a spectrum in the same way sexuality and gender exist on a spectrum. Just like some of us are super girly girls and some of us are pretty masculine girls, the same is true for sex drive. Some of us could go for it 10 times a day and others don't want it at all. And that's actually called asexuality and it's a perfectly valid way to be. But the vast majority of women fall somewhere in the middle and that's perfectly okay and normal. And I hate the way that we constantly make women think that they're broken because they don't crave sex. The other thing that a nasal spray based treatment like this really massively ignores is the way female libido works in relationships. When most women go to the doctor and complain of a loss of interest in sex, more often than not, those women are married or in long-term relationships. And studies have actually proven that women get sexually bored when we are in a monogamous setting. Monogamy is just like a giant libido killer for us. That's not to say we can't be in monogamous relationships, but it means our partner needs to work really hard to keep the mystery and the novelty alive, which goes back to the importance of having things like date nights, not always getting super comfortable with your partner and just letting it all hang out around the house and burping and farting in front of each other, spending some time apart to maintain mystery and have a sense of missing each other. All of these things are so important. And what we tend to find is women who say that they don't really have a sex drive anymore that are in a long-term relationship, more often than not, will actually masturbate a lot or they will go out and have sexual affairs. And both these things prove there's nothing wrong whatsoever with their drive for sex. It's just that they don't have a drive to keep having the same kind of sex with their partner. And I don't think a drug like this one they're trialing at the moment is going to do anything for that. And so my personal thoughts are that I am totally against it. I think there is an incredibly, incredibly tiny percentage of women who legitimately have actual medical reasons that are impacting 
what would be an otherwise strong sex drive. And maybe there's a small case for those women to trial something like this, but for the vast majority of women, the numbers of women suffering low libido is, is very overinflated, like I say, because it just doesn't acknowledge any of these other factors. But that's my thoughts. You guys let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Sarah Holden was enjoying what appeared to be a perfectly normal girls' night with her best friend Shauna Littlewood in the UK when the two girls became very drunk and Sarah, who is gay and had come out as gay earlier to her friend, decided to kiss her friend. Now, her friend Shauna appeared to reciprocate the kiss and actually suggested getting quite kinky and going into the bedroom and tying her up. So Sarah decided to throw caution to the wind and just go with it. Well, soon after she tied her up, Shauna left the room to go and get something. Now, Sarah thought that her friend was leaving the room to go and get a sex toy, but instead she returned with a knife and stabbed her repeatedly. Now, she was unable to move and thought that she was going to die. Thankfully, after more than 14 hours of surgery, she did recover and she has lived to tell the tale. Littlewood has recently been jailed for attempted murder. And so this is why Sarah is speaking out publicly about it. And I think this is a really interesting case. I think in particular, it's very interesting the way that it has been framed in the media as a Fifty Shades of Grey style BDSM kind of play gone wrong. And the reason I think this is interesting because so often the BDSM community gets such a bad name when stories like this happen in the news. There is seems to be this real, I guess, obsession with the media to really demonize the BDSM community and treat people who are into kink and who are into kink play and bondage and things like tying up their partners as if they are there is something wrong with them and so it's very common for these stories to be framed in the media as kink gone wrong or bdsm acts when actually there doesn't seem to truly be a correlation of that at all all we know is that the two girls kissed one girl tied the other up and the next thing she was essentially attempting to murder her. She's bizarrely come out since then and said that she was just drunk and regrets it. I think there's probably some severe mental illness going on there, but I think we really just need to take a look at the way that these stories are framed in the media and, and have a more critical eye on them. There is also this idea that people who participate in BDSM do so because they have some sort of trauma in their past or specifically sexual trauma. And so they use BDSM to work through or even to reenact that trauma. But actually there's really little research to back this up. While there are undoubtedly members of the BDSM community who do find BDSM a really good kind of therapy for working through their own past issues, there are many, many more members of the BDSM community who don't have any history of trauma and simply participate in BDSM because they enjoy BDSM. And so I think we, like I say, really need to look at these sorts of stories with a critical eye. I don't really see any example of this particular sex act being BDSM and so I just think it's it's very interesting the way it's portrayed in that and also the way that it has been portrayed as like a Fifty Shades of Grey style thing because Fifty Shades of Grey has so many flaws when it comes to its portrayal of BDSM. If you speak to anyone in the BDSM community, they will tell you it in no way represents the foundations of BDSM and what BDSM stands for. But again, those are my thoughts. If you practice BDSM, I'm extra interested to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comment section down below. And in a very cheeky article, Pamela Anderson has said that converting her husband to a vegan diet has helped him become like a new man, specifically saying that vegans make better lovers in the bedroom because 
vegans are healthier? Well, I'm obviously mega biased here for those of you that don't know. I have been a vegan for 10 years. Man, I like to think it's helped me be pretty good in the bedroom, though I just think I'm good in the bedroom anyway because I'm super confident like that. But <laughs> seriously, there actually are some proven health benefits to going vegan. It's very hard to have high cholesterol as a vegan because you're not taking in cholesterol. You just can't when you're eating only plants. And it can be really good also for your skin, your weight, your energy, and all those sorts of things. I definitely noticed some health benefits when I became vegan 10 years ago, but you can obviously still be an unhealthy vegan. I was also a very unhealthy, very out of shape vegan for a long time. So I definitely wouldn't put a great sex life specifically down to a diet. That said, if you do want to improve your sex life, specifically your libido and your stamina through food, there are some great foods that you can focus on. In particular for women, it's great to focus on getting more essential fatty acids into your diet because those can help with lubrication and keeping you having that juicy WAP as Cardi B would put it. So if you are not a plant-based eater, you can have something like salmon. That can be really good. Also olive oil is fantastic. Nuts and avocado. These are all things that are really great for your friend downstairs. And as for the theory that oysters are an aphrodisiac, well, they can be for some people. It's suggested that some of the compounds in them can help people to feel more frisky and rambunctious, but really I personally think it's just a placebo. There's not a lot of super strong research to support that it is, but oysters can be a sexy thing to eat on a date night. So now I am gonna be controversial and say that as a vegan of 10 years, I actually still eat oysters. I know, right? They're technically not vegan, but hear me out. I feel like oysters like really aren't an animal. It's like a bit of slime in a shell. Like they don't have a face or a brain. They can't feel pain. I don't feel like it's cruel to eat one. Is that just weird? Like, is that just me? Am I the only vegan who does that? Does anyone else agree with this theory? Anyway, that's my weird theory of the day. And on that note, I think we will wrap up here. <laughs> so that was this week in sex. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, guys, if you haven't already, so that you get notified when my videos are going live, which also means hitting that notification bell and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And I will see you all in the next video. Gonna go off and eat some oysters. <laughs>